Hello and welcome to another episode of Surveyor Says. My name is Tim Birch. I'm sitting in for Kurt Sumner again this week. And we've got uh, a great topic uh, leading into our upcoming virtual uh, survey and GIS summit with Eurissa. And today, um, believe it or not, for, for those in the NSPS world that aren't, that aren't aware of it, there's actually two Van Horns that survey in Wisconsin. So we've been dealing with Lisa on the national level, uh, our, our past president. Well, she's actually married to a surveyor, Mr. Les Van Horn, who has graciously uh, agreed to join me today. And we're going to talk about some early GIS, really, I'm guessing less before it was really kind of called GIS, I would, would assume. So thank you, Les, for taking some time to explain some things about uh, the Brown County system and some great surveying that happened in Wisconsin uh, many, many years ago. Yeah, thank you for inviting me. Um, yeah, I'd like to cover a few things. I was, uh, you know, really involved with GIS in the very earliest stages of it, and uh, in levels from the local government up to the state level. So uh, we uh, in Wisconsin have been working real hard. We're putting together land information systems, uh, starting with the. Uh, a governor task force that was created in 1968, or no, it was later than that, sorry about that, about 1978. And uh, it uh, dealt with dealing with uh, incomplete data sets and how surveyors and other land use uh, professionals uh, had to get information and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, I'm not sure where you want me to go with it to start with. I can cover, you know, what we did in Brown County and then my involvement at the state level. And... Sure, sure. Well, I guess first off for our listeners, um, obviously, I should say obviously, uh, Wisconsin is a public uh, land survey state, but I guess around Brown County, there were several different systems that were, uh, that, that came into play besides just the PLSS. Can you tell us a little bit about all yeah. of the other factors we had to you had to deal with in, in basically setting up this these base maps? Sure. Um, well, unfortunately or fortunately, whatever it is, because of the early history in Brown County uh, and, and the uh, political arena that went around that, to, we ended up with uh, basically eight different types of public land survey systems or survey oh. systems that were. Uh, executed all the way from the 1820s up to uh, the uh, 1920s. So I think that we had a last I uh, island survey that was done in the 1920s, but we started out with the uh, private claims after the War of 1812. Um, the Brown County area up here was uh, one of those which was uh, heavily influenced by the uh, French uh, Indian trades. And uh, as such, we had private land holdings that uh, uh, had to be recognized as part of the treaty at Gallant um, when we solved the, uh, the dispute between uh, England and, uh, and the United States. And so when we uh, uh, dealt with that, each one of the land holders that were in existence along the river, which was of course the main mode of transportation and the highway system that existed at the time, they recognized all of the uh, individual claims. Uh, those claims had to be certified by a local person and then uh, transmitted to the United States uh, government. And then they had to actually confirm each one of these individual claims based upon the affidavits that were filed and the different documents that were uh, reviewed as part of their claims for the uh, uh, for the for the area, it primarily started at the mouth of the Fox River and then run in about 26 miles up to which is now the city of Depeer, and run from the uh, river back to uh, at initially it was a, basically a non-disclosed back lot line or back line it was just to, the influence was to claim your uh, access along the river boundaries. So wow. they finally wow. got, they, they got individually confirmed in uh, 1928. 
or they actually got confirmed a little bit before that, but they actually had to be surveyed then. And in 1928, they actually surveyed the boundaries of each one of these claims and created about 46 of them. Um, and on one side and another 30 or 40 on the other side of the river. So um, it created a very unusual situation, primarily focusing on the boundary, the direction of the river and then running back until they enclosed a certain area of land, so. Wow, okay. And then the, the section town and range survey started in the 1930s and continued all the way up until the 1830s and went until the 1860s. Um, then we had the, uh, uh, the Oneida Indian Reservation was a boundary that was uh, recognized as part of a treaty with the uh, Menominee Indians at the time and given to the Oneidas when the Oneida Indians were transported out of uh, New York and convinced to abandon their lands and holdings in New York were transferred out to uh, Wisconsin sure. and particularly Green Bay. Uh, so those boundaries were created in, uh, in 1838 and uh, held as just one big block of land at about, it was about, uh, I forget, ran about nine miles back from the face of the river and then about 25 miles uh, southeasterly down to encompass the, the track for the reservation. Um, they also had as part of that, inside of the reservation, he had a private claim that was given to a guy that was going to supposedly bring religious uh, uh, endeavors to the Oneidas. Um, <laughs> but it was kind of surprising that uh, only five years after the uh, initially created the boundaries of this, that he subdivided that tract of land, which was about three and a half miles wide, and about four miles long, and he subdivided that into 40 acre tracks. Um, so it was a private land grant, and then we've got private land grants right inside the city of Green Bay that was given to the uh, Chicago and Northwestern Railroad that ran up in here. And then uh, we have uh, island surveys, we've got omitted lands, we have the Oneida Indian Reservation that was broke down in 1875 into a rectangular survey system. And the sections then were divided into 40-acre uh, tracts uh, using what's called the, now called the Three Mile Method by the BLM, where they actually created all the interior 40 corners running at east and west across the section. So. Um, it was uh, my ex investigations when I was early in my, I was appointed county surveyor in 1975. And as part of my initial uh, indoctrination to this area of uh, these unique survey systems, I spent uh, about a week and a half out in Washington, D.C. at the National Archives and then at the BLM, securing all the survey records and information that I could ever you know, extract out of those areas and stuff. So um, that was an interesting time and, and great information brought back to the to the courthouse so that I can put it on file for other surveyors to use. So wow. Um, so that's kind of a history of our breakdowns. Like I say, we have the omitted lands in the island surveys that came in later on. So what I guess just hearing all of these different systems, I, I guess even beyond just being, you know, a fellow surveyor, I guess my my initial question is, I mean, how did all, how did all of these maps and surveys and all these things, how did these all eventually, I mean, come together? I mean, who was who back in the mid 1800s back in there? I mean, who would have been in charge of keeping all of these records and somehow keeping all of these parcels and systems straight? Well, it's a part of the uh, original government surveys, of course, and all of those got maps individual to each one of the surveys that were done. But at the local level, yeah, it got to be uh, uh, quite complex. And uh, as part of that, in uh, eight, in uh, 1900, or right around that time frame, uh, a local individual that was responsible at the courthouse, uh, Kofi Beaumont, um, created what was called our tract index which uh, allowed us to uh, see, uh, develop the tract indexing system, itemizing and identifying each one of these particular tracts of land and then listing and going back into the old deeds 
uh, created a history of the tract index so that we had a grantor grantee and a tract, a geographic tract index that allowed you to, you know, keep track of the lands and to follow through with it. And uh, um, it, I, one of those kind of uh, things that I actually inherited later on in my career as county surveyor was called our track index department and it actually got rolled into the county surveyor's office, which wow. is also one of the uh, reasons why I got heavily involved in the, uh, the initial GIS investigation and computerization of our land records. Well, and I tell you what, if nothing else, if nothing else for, for young people to hear about uh, exciting uh, career opportunities, uh, I just, I can't imagine what it was like digging up all of this great information. I mean, this, this was some serious history that you ended up having to, to, to dig through, compile, uh, basically reestablish to, to know basically what was what. Uh, in for all of these systems. It, it, it is very interesting and it's surprising how it evolved over time because all of these systems weren't created simultaneously. Of course, they evolved in as the areas developed certain areas, certain private claims did not get, uh, um, did, did not get uh, identified right away. And I also forgot we had one more uh, public land survey system identification, and that was our Fort Howard Military Reserve. It was an actually military re reservation wow. that was signed by John Quincy Adams on June 29th of uh, 1829, and it was the last act that he signed in his in his presidential career. And I actually got a map up to the courthouse signed by him that created those boundaries, and that, that was subdivided cool. in. It was subdivided into 40 acre tracts and then smaller tracts and then given to in 1863 and then paid off some of the uh, soldiers that were fighting in the Civil War at the time. So, and that's part of the heart of Green Bay right now. As a matter of fact, I actually live on one of those parcels. Oh, wow. So, <laughs> well, that's that's yeah. really cool. <laughs> Well, okay, so we've got, you've got all of these maps, all of these systems, all of, I mean, these documents and deeds and, and descriptions. All right, Mr. Surveyor, how do these fit on the ground? I mean, how, I mean, this is, this is a, a, a I mean, literally a, a lifelong career uh, activity trying to put all this stuff together. Yes, it is. And it, it really started, the, the ground side of it is that I started when shortly after I was county surveyor, I went to the uh, uh, election records and found the um, records of who was county surveyor from day one to the day that I took over office. And it started as a district surveyor before we had county surveyors. And, and then uh, as the I uh, did a presentation where I actually developed the county boundary system in the, in the entire state of Wisconsin that showed how each one of the county boundaries was created similar to what they do at the national level for state boundaries. And it was extremely interesting because you see that in certain areas that large counties, that's Brown County, because we were at one time in the state of Wisconsin only in two counties. We had Crawford County that comprised of the western half of the state and Brown County, which was the eastern half of the state in 18, uh, 1818 to 1835 by that time. And then when the public land survey system started, then you saw the creation of individual county boundaries other than just the two counties that we had here. And the district surveyor pretty much covered the entire state and uh, both sides of the uh, both sides of the state, the guy by the name of of John V. Saddam, and I, it was strange. I tried to search his records because I didn't find any of his records in the courthouse. Wisconsin's got a law that says the county surveyor has to pass down his records from surveyor to surveyor. And inside the survey records that I received that when I took over as county surveyor, I only had records from 1875 up until uh, the 1920s and then some of the records were missing and things like that. So in order to complete those records, like I said, I did a, re uh, did a rediscovery of who the county surveyors were and, and chased down those records. I actually chased a set of records down to Casa Grande's New Mexico where I 
found out where the guy had signed his deed of the property when he left here and, and it was notarized in New Mexico. And uh, so I called the local library down there and said, I, you know, what I was trying to find. And she said, well, I'll get back to you. And she called me the next day and she says, boy, you hit a home run on this one. He said, the surveyor himself was uh, worked for the federal government when he was down there and ended up getting killed in Mexico, shot in Mexico and became a border issue with the United States. And so anyway, I chased down, I chased down his family and his family, uh, you know, I has last name and stuff. And I, I did a genealogy search on him, figuring out who his families were up here anyway, and had a name for him. And I, you know, asked the librarian if she would look in her directory and see if she had this guy's name. And she did. So I called the number and identified myself, who I was and what I was looking for. And she says, well, she says, yeah, he passed away ago, about six months ago. And he uh, took all of his, well, we burnt all of his books and we took all of his maps on these linen cloths and we threw those away, except I've got a few of them that I use for shirt patterns and stuff. So she sent those up to me and inside the records <laughs> at the courthouse and it was one of those maps. And ironically, it was in an area that was in the, where the private land grant was with the, uh, with the uh, Oneidas at the time. And it was a disputed area and it was kind of cool to be able to put some resolution to that area why we had conflicts between them so yeah that was that was extremely interesting so unreal well, are you sure hollywood's not gonna tr track you down to write a screenplay <laughs> on all this stuff i mean wow i mean well uh, you, you know i have to go ahead no i was just gonna say i just it you know i've I, i've i've heard uh Lisa and Tom talk about this 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 project with Brown County and the actual GIS system, but really, I, I guess you know the, the the several years that I've gotten to know you and Lisa that I've I've really I, I'm I'm thoroughly enjoying this this uh, this explanation of what I mean. This is passion, and 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 yes, surveyors typically do have a, a lot of passion for what they do, but. Les, I've got a newfound uh, respect for you and uh, for all all you've ch you've chased down all this time. Holy cow, this is incredible! It, it leads it leads right back to the question, you know, how do you retrace, you know, the monuments and, and look for a monument if you don't have the records and know what you're looking for? So that was the first precipitous behind the trying to find the information that I'm supposed to be uh, working on, which is kind of leading into our GIS aspects of it. But, right, right. You know, one thing that we've had up here in Northeast Wisconsin and in Wisconsin uh, overall, I'll, I'll go back to the Wisconsin Society of Land Surveyors. We've had good, strong leadership in the, inside of that organization, and they have led yes. to some very good laws in the state of Wisconsin. We've got the Remonumentation Act that was done in 1968, and then we also got at that same time period, they rewrote the minimum standards and created the Recording Act for surveys. So along with the fact that we have a 20 year mandate or we were dictated the 20 year mandate of remonumenting the public land survey system, anybody that did a survey off from that public land survey system or any other survey had to file it at the courthouse, which was the original inception of the fact that the county surveyors are supposed to hand their records down from surveyor to surveyor so they can right. have a complete record of the history. So, you know, once we get the fact that we know what we're supposed to be looking for, then we can go into the field and start looking for the actual monumentation itself. And that got into how the various counties in Wisconsin we're able to start to accomplish this. And, and I'll go back to just the, the, the WSLS aspects of it. It was strong leaderships like Tom Sprague and Arden Sands and Don Paulson, Tony Kudrowski. Those guys had loud voices with political connections inside of the state and really kicked off our remonumentation law and then our uh, and then our uh, uh, Monumentation Act and, and the Minimum Standards Act. So you could talk about mentorship. It's those kind of guys that lead you to say, these are strong leaders with political connections that make things happen. And you develop your, your associations with these individuals and you really gain a lot of respect for what they've accomplished and you'll just strive to carry it forward. So 
And then we get Absolutely. on to the land information program. You know, we got Jim Clapp, Ben Neiman, Paul Wolf at the UW system back in the 70s and early 80s, strong national leaders and educators in, you know, creating the, the overall uh, impetus to put together these land information systems itself and studying how we were going to go about it. You know, they, they along with the Wisconsin Society of Land Surveyors and other uh, active members created the uh, uh, a governor created a land records commission that studied the overall complexity of what we had to deal with and what we were dealing with was the actual transfer of you know paper maps that were stored in metal drawers and and uh, um, very haphazardly organized down into something that we said we've got to have a a better way of getting to this information to the public. It's better for government, it's better for the public, and it's better for the citizens themselves and the professions in order to be able to accomplish simple research without having to go from office to office to office to, you know, it was just endless back then. It was just absolutely crazy. And as such, sometimes you miss things. Right, right. Well, I guess a question I have for you, go, you know, obviously going back a little ways, because really GIS obviously took off once uh, the use of the, of the computer was a little more, uh, you know, modernized and, and, and uh, ease of use and things. Um, you know, and I had this conversation uh, going back a couple of weeks ago with Dave Doyle and talking about establishing state plan coordinates and doing things before there were computers, before it was so easy, I mean, b before a handheld calculator really I mean, had sine, cosine, tangent on it, I mean, take me back to the, to the early 70s on trying to basically database all of this land system on paper. Sure. Well, it, and that was a, a major problem back then, of course, was databases and, and computer systems. As a land surveyor, we started using my my first computer was in 1970 with an Olivetti 101. Let me tell you, that was you thought you had the world by the back side once you you know, had that. And then you know we bought our first handheld calculator. We paid 375 dollars for one that adds, subtract, multiplied, and divided. And we could take a nine place traverse table out into the to the field and actually do calculations as we were actually doing the survey, which was unheard of at the time when you're working mm -hmm. with any precision tools, you know. I mean, we always had the government tables that had two places you wanted to run Latin loans off and something like that. But yeah, and then once we were, you know, we at Brown County, we had, uh, a, again, good, solid political leaders that allowed us to create a strong land information program. Um, we had one guy that was really influential at the time that uh, it, it, it's surprising how certain things can haunt you, but he was a, a, a Bob <laughs> Hadley, and Bob was a strong county surveyor and a very methodical, he worked for the uh, Corps of Engineers, I think, or one of the federal governments, it might have been Coast and Geodetic, but anyways, he was also a local uh, resident here in Green Bay, and it turns out my first job up here, I ended up buying his house without even knowing it. But anyways, he, he developed one of the local politician that absolutely hated him, and he that politician haunted me for 30 years until he passed away. So, but anyways, the other guys, you know, I mean, between him, Chuck Roman, and you know, another one, uh, uh, Jago Burnett, he was a highway commissioner, and then you know, Darwin Hens, who bought the first massive computer to do calculations around here in Green Bay, it was just instrumental with again, good, strong political leadership that had their ear, you know, and, and convinced right. them that to do a, a program that's going to work, we needed a solid county surveyor's program. And they convinced them that we would fund the county surveyor's office with a full-time office and staff. And their job was to do remonumentation. And, and initially, that was my focus job of filing and doing monumentation. But of course, after you put together remonumentation, the first thing you got to do is calculate and missing corners and stuff. So, you know, you're out there with, you know, handheld computers and stuff trying to do, you know, 10 cent calculations off in single lines to reposition a lost corner. But <laughs> until you get into 
you know, relocating a lost corner. I, I've got one township where it was actually run where the it was a run in reverse and we had all of the closing corners along the southern boundary of the township instead of along the north and if you're trying to relocate a missing quarter corner along there you you, know, you really got to know how it's done i've got another township that was actually surveyed with a chain that was a link long it took me probably about six years to figure out once you go through and start looking at developing an overall township survey you can You'll never see that trying to retrace just one or two corners in a township until you right. put together the whole thing. And once I did that, it was easy enough. You know, I, it was easy enough to, to see how you develop the pattern. And not only was it surveyed with a chain long, it was surveyed with a method where you started at the south east corner of section thirty five. Uh, no, south yeah, section thirty five, and then run north and. It just, he stubbed in all the quarter corners and stuff. And with a chain that was a link long, it just continually, you know, migrated up where everything got distributed. So it, 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 it's really surprising, but to try to do that without a, a good computer and a mathematical ability to analyze that data. I started with the, you know, early in the eighties we had, well, before we had the, the uh, IBMs, I worked with a, uh, I worked with a Survey 31 computer. We paid $12,000 for that back in the early, late 70s, you know, and nowadays it's something like, I don't know what the equivalent would be today, but, you know, I mean, with the first uh, the first computer that I got from IBM was the old, uh, the, uh, what was it? It only had 540K in it anyway, and it wouldn't, you know, when we had the 641, I could finally get a survey program. It was AutoCAD 101, and I could put on that thing. To start doing some simple mapping, bought a fifteen thousand dollar pen plotter that I convinced the county board to buy for me, so that my when my staff called in sick, I didn't have to worry about not drawing maps. So, <laughs> was, you know, yeah, you know, but you know, but, you know, we eventually got our PLS sufficiently modern minute and the GIS programs starting to be on an infancy. So I started uh, running township control over this stuff and trying to build a, you know, overall countywide map. And uh, one thing that I, you know, you recover all of the first and second order triangulation stations that are possibly uh, still in existence and tying to those. And the accuracies, you know, we run our, our control. I controlled the entire county at the time with a top mounted uh, EDM and a T2. All the angles were turned eight times and distance is always measured back and forth and, and I, but I couldn't have a I didn't have a the, the survey 31 didn't have a least squares program for it so we ended up uh, contracting myself and Don Barnes who was the county surveyor down around the, the Janesville area contracted with the University of Madison to rewrite their uh, main their main uh, frame computer down to the old IBM system to, so that we could do a least squares adjustment on it. We paid them like $5,000 to rewrite that program, you know, between the two counties. And sure. We finally had a fact of, of putting a, at least a least squares program that you could use on a, you know, on a computer that a courthouse could buy instead of something that a university or a major co corporation would put in, you know. So, and then we had the problem, well, we're starting to run all this fancy traverse stuff and we're hitting these first and second order for triangulation stations, which are only one in a hundred thousand positions at best, you know? Right. Well, that doesn't work with today's EDMs when you run five miles and you're missing something by a couple of feet, you're wondering what the heck's wrong here, six miles or 12 miles. And so your traverse closures are really tight, but your distances or your control stations are being worked out by, you know, bad, well, not bad, you're being worked out by values that are constrained by, you know, previous coordinate values of a, right. a of program. So we actually hired a, again, GPS was just in its infancy. So we hired a, uh, we hired a company to come in and run GPS control on, on our township corners and on the, the around six miles square and we paid I think about eighty thousand hundred thousand dollars to pay it and do that so we 
and then we it was in, in its infancy so we were actually working with the, the dot at the time and they were well aerometric engineering which was a, a major company on our, on our area uh, did excellent work and they were actually down in Meads Ranch, Kansas and doing their GPS stuff there in order to make sure that all this stuff would lock together and Doppler of course was a very infancy and in, in its infancy in GPS and it wasn't very accurate but once they got into uh, the new satellite stuff you know it really worked out a lot better but yeah once we got that we constrained our traverse adjustments into the you know into the new stuff so I ended up with uh, two, I uh, broke the county into two different adjustments in, in order to run it. It was a four, it took the computer four days to run the adjustment and it was, an 8, <laughs> it was an 8,000 point least squares adjustment that I run constrained off on the, you know. Oh uh, my. For the various points, but at least from there, then we could start building our local GIS system, you know. Because then I could all of, could start doing our section protractions and breakdowns and stuff like that and linking together all these survey systems into a map that actually made sense for us that, you know, showed up the all of the anomalies of what worked and what didn't work and where we had bad work and where we had bad title work. And, and so, yeah, that... Uh, it moved along, but once we got that into place, you know, Al Van der Rohe and Von de Witt, well, Von, uh, Von de Witt was in his infancy. I don't remember, you just recently, or not too long ago, gave Bon a, an award down in, in Florida for his uh, service as an instructor. He yes. was the one who actually designed that, that Lee Squares program for us. And that was used for a whole number of years until Lee Squares, or until, uh, uh, Starnet came out with a version of their own that pretty much emanated. Right. But their their version did not, did, still did not uh, equal out to the system that they designed for us for the weighting methods and things like that for their least squares adjustments was just amazing. Their air trapping routines and things that they had in there really, really helped us out because you had, you know, if you had a bad network that came out with a, you know, a, a heavy, uh, a heavy number in our least squares you had to go back in and shake it down to figure out why and you know where's the weakness of it and that's what the that's what their program did for us was uh, really work that out and, and break it down because we would run individual closures on each one of the sections and then we'd run individual closures on the townships and then from the townships we'd go out to the overall uh, larger network from there you know and and uh, boy without that program i'll tell you we would have been uh, before that, I was always trying to do it with just a compass rule adjustment, and you'd be amazed right. how it really distort a, a, a good traverse into a bad adjustment. So, yep, but, exactly. Yeah, so you take so, all, so you, got, you have all this data, uh, and you, you've done all of this work, you've done all this compiling, and all this, all these adjustments. I mean, once you have all of these coordinates set up for this, basically this GIS. What did you, how, I mean, at, and at what point, you know, I guess it depends on the, the, the age range as well, the time frame. What, where did you house that? What computer program or what computer uh, system did, did that get housed in? I mean, was that in, a, in an AutoCAD or uh, where, was, where did all that information lie? Sure. Um, it was all in, a, in an AutoCAD files. And uh, the uh, overall file was, to, and that's how we built our, our GIS system was off the AutoCAD base. And it, at least for the, the cartographic aspects of it. Um, one of the, uh, you know, the things that, uh, the other programs that were out there for GIS and AutoCAD really at the time was not a good GIS program. It was a good mapping right. program. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to attaching data to it, it's just, it didn't equal what ARC Info is. And the problem with ARC Info at the time, it didn't do the CAD work. So, you know, what we ended up doing was, and we still do it, I think, to this day, as we build everything in AutoCAD and then convert it over into, uh, <clears throat> convert it over into uh, the ARC Info format. But on the local side of it is that when you're dealing with local land records, what we found is that you can't work with state plane coordinates because you got to all every if you're familiar with state plane coordinates every line every separate line had a separate combination factor and 
If you right. really wanted to believe it, you had to keep the scale factor times your elevation factor to get a combination factor in each line, and each line would have a different number to it. And it was just too cumbersome because my right. abstract listing people would have no idea how to do that, and they were the <laughs> ones that were mapping in my uh, deeds, you know. So, you know, we had to, what we did with, with Bond DeWitt and Al Vondero is they created our county coordinate system, and that's the one that we use today, and I think it's referred to as, a, uh, Lisa wrote it down here someplace for it, it's the lower accuracy, oh. something or another. Yeah, low distortion. <laughs> Yeah, low distortion. Yep, low distortion. Per, yeah, low distortion projection system. Yeah, it, the, um, that's kind of the, the 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 wave of the future, and uh, I do believe that uh, Wisconsin with the county systems were way ahead of the curve versus our 2022 well, we data that's coming up. We created it, let me tell you, and it was you know one of those where it took a little bit of trial and error. But let me say that boy, I tell you, once it was put into place, you know everybody loved it because you didn't have to worry about conversion factors and theta angles. And you know another thing that really disturbs me is when you look at the maps that are created as a as a local surveyor. Now, when you look at mm -hmm. maps that are created in, in the state plane coordinate system. If you can get maps that are, you know, distorted by damn near, two, excuse me, by nearly two degrees in, in deflection off from the uh, off right. the grid from two. So when you have a, you know, a lot of maps that are done at the local level and you're throwing a north south line off two degrees, it really looks kind of out of place. So yes, in order to solve, you know, it looks a lot nicer and presents a much cleaner, realistic local map when you map it on a on a local projection. So. That well, has really, uh, really taken off. Well, good, good. Well, and I guess so. A good question I have for, I guess, uh, as a practitioner, some you know, a, a local surveyor in Brown County that's put that's going using your maps, and you know, now with the the ease of GPS and jumping out of the truck and uh, you know, real time network and and I you know, I assume all of this stuff has been you know been uh, Put back into the the, the, the whiz dot core system and all that if somebody pops out of the truck and fires up their real-time network uh receiver i mean are they are they hitting these I mean, I'm, I'm assuming they're hitting these numbers pretty well dead dead on well first of all if you're using coordinates you should use them as a as a stakeout value not as a you know this yes. is where it's got to be that you understand coordinates, you'll find out, you know, and I, I got a good friend of mine up in, uh, in the Oneida County area, and Mike Ramporto, and Mike is a firm believer in uh, coordinates. And I said, you know, to this day, and I, we, we always joke back and forth, I always got a pocket for coordinates, you know, and it's just, well, <laughs> you know, if you understand how a if you understand how a coordinate is derived, you can understand, you know, if you got a hole in the pocket, you're not missing much. So it's just. Uh, <laughs> uh, this is true. This you know, is true. And, but, but for, really yeah, dangerous for with, yeah, to be able to find it's, some it's, stuff to be able to help, you're right. It is dangerous. Use it as a stakeout value. It was a Lancer, you know, we back onto the Brown County system. We rebuilt every deed. I had eight professional licensed land surveyors that worked 12 years to build our cadaster. Wow. And every deed was put in by a land surveyor. And when we look at it today, and you, and, you know, I, I retired from there in 2002 and went into private practice with Lisa. And I use those values on a day-to-day -day basis. And, you know, I can walk out and, and you know, most of the time we get within probably five, six inches of where a local survey point might be that we had mapped into our system. And many times, of course, our PLS system, that would most of the time would drop in within probably an inch or two of the, of the coordinate value that's there. And that's a problem because the more that the younger surveyors are, are starting to rely on this stuff as gospel. Instead of using it as a stakeout file, they use it as their as a, as a stakeout file to set their final boundaries. You know, and it's right. not, they're not doing their own work. They're doing the you know, it's a you know a nice compliment on our part to say that we did a good job at the local level. But the problem is, all that work is meant to do is to say you can prove it, prove the stuff out, and bring your own data in and make your own right. decisions on where to set the land values. 
at least for a taxation base, and this is what happened and why it got stolen, is our county exec at the time when we started building our GIS system, he was a county treasurer and he was elected to the uh, position of county executive. When he was county treasurer, he took foreclosure on a piece of property where our property listing file, which was based on our old paper maps, took foreclosure on a 27 acre piece of property that was in a very area that was being heavily developed. Come out to be that the survey of the actual property come up to be about 17 acres. And as a local politician, he at the time he was a treasurer, he was confronted with the fact of where the hell's my 10 acres I just bought from you guys. <laughs> and it went over like a red balloon. And the guy that bought it was pretty influential on top of that. And he didn't, you know, so it, it was one of those when I said the first thing we got to do when we're building a GIS system is you build it from the ground up. You understand when you build a house, you put it in a foundation and it builds a foundation. If you got a bad foundation, the top's going to top uh, topple on you. The data is only as good as the data that goes in. And if you drum, rubber sheet your data from crap ass maps, they're going to have crap ass decisions on it. And we built it off from all geodetic data and, and it was supported. And, you know, politically, we were supported. Our register of deeds supported us. Our planning department supported us. They were always asking, when is it going to be done? When is it going to be done? But now, when they, you know, or using it on a day-to-day -day basis. It's, it's surprising, you know, to see how it is, has been and accepted as the God's gospel instead of why is it so damn bad, you know? Right. With today's environment of the uh, digital for photography and how accurate that builds out nowadays, you can see all the mistakes on all of these poorly mapped uh, GIS systems when they backdrop it with now our new, you know, greatly controlled, um, digital ortho photography where you get six inch pixel photography that you can, you know, basically see, you know, accuracies within a foot on these things a lot of times. Uh -huh. You can see where the frequencies are. So, you know, the realtors use it to say, you know, hey, we got, we got problems here and problems there. The problem, I, I'll diverge a little bit with the digital ortho photography. The problem with that is that you get the distortion from the top of the building to the bottom of the building which will show false encroachments or false yes. things being over a boundary line. And it's hard to explain to people why that difference is there. But, you know, it's surprising how well, you know, they, the people in the closing to real estate now will say, well, based on the GIS map, it looks like you should get a survey here before we close this, you know. And, yes. Or they'll ask for a title exception and things like that. So. In some of our adjacent counties where they used rubber sheeting processes and because they they just didn't have full-time surveyors offices in order to institute a good solid base map, they you know went the, the quick and dirty route and got a map out there for people to look at. But again, once you start seeing these fancy digital ortho photographies being dropped on top of there, it's uh, you know it's disclosing a lot of things that aren't there, showing property lines being in a location where they really they're mapped in one location, but in reality, they're some distance away from where they are showing on their GIS, which creates all kinds of problems. Exactly. Well, I got to tell you that it, these are great examples of why the surveyor and the GIS systems themselves, the GIS professionals, we need to work hand in hand. You're right that it's because we're creating so much more data that is uh, for lack of a better term, geographically accurate, uh, we need to merge it with that good foundation of the, the survey cadastres that we're needing to create from, uh, from terrific work like, uh, like you've done there in Brown County. Um, I think this is a perfect mm -hmm. example of why it needs to be put together. And it needs to be put together by a licensed surveyor that understands land boundaries and coordinate values and the issues that go along with the fact if you put something out the contract and don't do a quality assurance on it, subcontract to a sec an independent vendor to check the quality of the work that you're getting from those people that are developing these right. systems. It's, you know, it, yeah, we understand government and I worked on it for 28 years before I retired. And let me tell you, you saw many, many units of government go with 
contracting based on low price. And I understand that as a taxpayer, but as a professional, if it's not quality based, you got to make sure that you do a separate contract to make sure that you get quality control on behalf of that, sec that first contractor. It's got to be independent. Garbage in, garbage out. So um, that is absolutely uh, sage advice there. Uh, quality based, uh, quality based selection is is very important, obviously, for a lot of reasons. And the biggest reason right here now is, like you said, the quality control uh, that uh, that it, you can't put a price on, uh, a, a low bid price on. So, no, that's fantastic. Uh, that, that's like that's. That's uh, that's great. That's some decent words of wisdom right there. I appreciate that. Um, I guess uh, trying to be uh, respectful of your time, Les. I appreciate you taking some time here to talk about the Brown County stuff. Um, it, I guess looking back through all of this, I mean that was a lot. I mean you were talking about a lot of work that you've done here. Um, you got to be pretty proud of this career you've got. Uh, you had here and, and all of the things you put together. This is fantastic. It's been fun over the years, that's for sure. And, you know, it's been, I have to say, it, it, kudos to the profession, the surveying profession here in Wisconsin, in particular here in the Northeast Wisconsin area, is we all work hard and there's always competition from firm to firm. But boy, I'll tell you, when it comes to issues that need to be done, they stand together shoulder to shoulder to stand behind what's right and what's wrong and what needs to be taken care of and, and things like that. So, um, yeah, a, a strong mentorship program, like I said, we've had good solid right. leaders at the, at the national level and now at the state level and even at the local level. So they're fun to work with. I, we've had great, great friends. Dave Mao is an individual. It's has mm -hmm. Mao and Associates here in Green Bay. An absolutely terrific firm, and talk about mentorship and the people they got running now, based off of Dave's mentorship. And he was, you know, he was a mentor to me and brought a lot of things locally, and uh, you know, strongly influenced the uh, local politicians with his words of wisdom and and things like that. So, you know, and now our our young surveyors coming up behind me. We've got great great guys you know, that, that have worked with me over the time that are now running the survey office and continuing mm -hmm. the business. Maintaining that system is, is really fun to watch and see how it's grown and evolved and, and even how it stood its test of time for strength over the, over the period of time, so. That's awesome. So I guess looking forward just um, with the future of surveying and seeing where some of the technology is going, uh, are you optimistic on, on the profession uh, continuing to grow? Well, I would say I'm cautiously optimistic. Um, again, good solid leaders create good fellowship on the people that follow us. And if we don't follow through with good solid intelligent leaders and people that respect you know, one another, um, it'll fall apart because it's easy enough with all the outside influences in our profession it could be easily lost if we don't take our time to uh, make sure that we protect the things that are ours and we protect those by professionalism and by actually showing and stand behind our things that we actually create and why we do it and how we do it. For our younger listeners, please take all of that to heart because uh, he, sp he speaks what he knows and that's, uh, that's, that's, it's fantastic words. Thank you, Les. That's uh, I really like I like that a lot. That's 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 uh, once again sage advice for uh, for the profession going forward. Um, so what? Uh, as uh, I, you're still dabbling in surveying a little bit, aren't you? Uh, I'd say are, are are you are you trying to be fully retired at this point? <laughs> I'm pretty much fully retired. I, you know, I do some speaking and things like that. But and then, you know, I enjoy our survey collection. It's one of those things where my my latest endeavor is that I'm bound and determined to learn to run a solar compass and then put on for our local chapter and even maybe at the state level some some uh, actual field experiences on running line with a with a solar compass and chain. So I'm working on that right now. 
very, very cool. <laughs> so that's, I mean, that just goes to show you can never keep a good surveyor down, no matter what. He says he's, yeah, even if he says he's retired, he's still dabbling in things here and there. So, well, I appreciate you taking some time with us today. And uh, 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 I guess we should also leave this on a good note that uh, 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 the Packers beat our local Bears today, so uh, there's got to be a, there's got to be a little bit of a smile on on uh, on Les's face. That, uh, you know, one of the things about that rivalry is that it's always a good game. You know, I mean, it was one of those where it's it's one that's you know been there for a hundred years. It's like our surveying profession; it's been there forever, and it's always enjoyable. It's hard to do at times, but yes, my it God, is. It's all said and done. But my most favorite game at the Packers game uh, I'll have to say is that we were it was uh, I think it was a late December game and it was miserable and you guys just beat the pants off from us and right at the end of the game we're, I don't know maybe minute and a half two minutes left and all of a sudden the whole crowd just started chanting the bears still suck the bears still suck and we were losing <laughs> whatever you know oh yeah <laughs> so it's always a good one. <laughs> there's always, yeah, there's always, it's, there's always good, good spirited rivalry, which is always awesome. Yes, so, yep. all right. Well, thank you, sir. Like I said, I appreciate you taking time with us today and, and really talking about the infancy uh, of GIS and really how well it comes together and how it marries with surveying. And uh, the Brown County example is, well, I think it's a fantastic example of GIS and surveying working together. I think it's also a spectacular example of uh the due diligence yep. and the thoroughness of of a great surveyor and uh thank you even for doing you that surveyor, even if you aren't a surveyor visit the site and see all that all the stuff that's been attached to that uh, to that base and, and it used to be all our local units of government used to do all their own local parcel maps and stuff and now they all all work off in this same parcel map for all of their things that they attach to them you know, all the way from rummage sales to <laughs> local infrastructure. So, you know, it, it's a it's a really amazing feature to see how it's how it's metamorphed into such a dynamic tool. That is cool. Very cool. Well, thank you, sir. And uh, we will uh, we'll we'll have to catch up with you again. Uh, I think we've got more stuff to talk about with you at some point in time, because. I, you know, you t you hinted the, right there about the uh, the survey equipment, the uh, antique survey equipment that you and Lisa uh, actually do little road shows on with things. And uh, if you don't mind, I'd love to have both of you back on talking about your collection and uh, how I mean how how far we've come uh, in technology, but I mean really how cool a lot of the stuff, the pieces you have. So if you don't mind, I would like to get get the two of you back on sometime soon. We'd appreciate it. No, you bet. Well, this will wrap it up for this week's uh, edition of Surveyor Says. Uh, stay tuned. We've got a couple of great episodes coming up uh, with uh, the, the Survey Summit right around the corner. So please, if you haven't already signed up, check that out, and we'll be seeing you soon. Thanks.